All right, in this segment, we'll further take a look at address translation. On the right, you see the figure that shows you the physical memory layout. You have the program that's laid out between 1000 and 1500. And so the first the CPU issues a logical address. You compare it against the base limit register to make sure that it's not trampling on other memory locations and not allocated to it. And then you add it. If the check succeeds and you're within the range, you go to the next step. Otherwise, you throw a memory exception. So first check is just your bounds check. It makes sure that your program is running within its specific bounds. Once that's been checked, you add it to a base register, which is essentially a relocation register, which says uh, address 0 on this program really corresponds to address 1000 in physical memory. Okay, so you, essentially it's an add operation. You can take whatever address you want, you add it to 1000, which is where this program starts off, and then you get your physical address, which is what the rest of the system sees and what you issue into the system. Okay. Here's uh, pop quiz question number two. With base and bounce registers, the OS needs a hole in physical memory at least as big as the process. True or false? So what we're trying to say is that if all you had was base and bounce checks, then the whole program either resides in memory, which means you need a hole as big as the pro program is to start off with, or you have to do worst case allocation, or it's not necessarily the case. The answer is true in this case, and you'll see why that is as we go along. So let's take a look at the dynamic allocation techniques, that is, how we're going to bend out space to these processes, and focus on the specific aspects of the fragmentation problem. There are two fragmentation problems, external and internal. So again, going back to a physical memory uh, layout, you can see the program P or O in this case has been laid out, and that's shown as the green portion. And you've got your program text, which is your code, data, execution stack. External fragmentation occurs when there's unused memory between units of allocation. So for example, between program Q and program R, in this case, the green and the blue. If you look at it, there's unused space, and if there's a process that's bigger than the space that's shown here, in the white space, then there's no way you're going to be able to allocate space for it, right? Because the amount of physical memory you have is less than what the process needs, and hence you can't run it. But the physical memory itself is not useful for anything else either, because there's no other process that needs it. So essentially, external fragmentation occurs when they've got two pieces of units of useful allocation, Q and R in this case, and there's white space between it that cannot be used because the process needs more space than that. Internal fragmentation is the case where unused memory occurs within a unit of allocation. For example, a party of three at a table of four. So the program itself needs only two gigs, for example, but you allocated four gigs because in the worst case, you assume that the program could be allocating data that grows all the way to four gigs. Essentially, if you've got unused memory within these unused memory of allocations, cannot this is known as internal fragmentation. So going back to the notion of address spaces again, essentially at the high level, you can think of it as Threads encapsulate concurrency, so they're an active component of a process, so they encapsulate work. And address space encapsulate protection are state, where essentially you, you prevent the buggy process from thrashing the rest of the system. Some aspects of, there are mainly three aspects of memory multiplexing, or this form of vending out memory in general. There's controlled overlap, translation, and protection. We'll deal with each of these as we're going along. Controlled overlap is that the state of the thread should not collide in physical memory. We've already looked at this where we check the bounds before we actually issue the address. Otherwise, obviously you're obviously going to expect unexpected chaos. Um, in converse, when processes do want to share something, you want to have the ability to overlap memory pages or data. 
we'll look at what pages are in a second, but essentially if they have two processes that share, that wish to share some piece of data, they should be able to do it easily and you should have the ability to overlap, allow both processes to access that shared data. Translation exists in order to convert virtual addresses to physical addresses. So to allow relocation. That's the sole purpose of translation, to make sure that programs when they compile may use the address 10, for example, but when they're on physical memory, because you have space at address 1000, you can relocate the program to address 1000, even though the program itself is referring to address 10. Finally, protection looks at preventing accesses to private memory of other processes. Uh, we will we haven't looked at it yet, but essentially you can give each part of your process uh, different permissions, like read-only, invisible to user programs, read-write permissions for everyone, uh, visible only to certain processes, and they can be given special behavior, which kind of can regulate at fine granularity what permissions different processes have to a certain page. Uh, this is how the OS itself protects itself from user programs. It essentially marks all its pages, all its state, as inaccessible by user programs. So let's go back to uni pro programming for a second. Uh, in this notion, we won't talk about multi cores just yet. But in uni programming, no trans can we have build a system with no translation or protection? This is an example of a system, embedded systems in the past, where they ran only one application, uh, one program really, and nothing else. Applications always run at the same place in physical memory, because there's only one application at a time, right? So you don't really need to regulate this. The early iPhones also used to follow something similar, where they only one program ran at a time. And applications can access any physical address, okay? So in this case, uh, if you look at this 32-bit address space, it can go all the way from 0 to 4 gigabyte address. And applications are given the illusion of a dedicated machine by really actually giving it a dedicated machine. So if there's only one application running at any given time, then there's no way that two applications can clobber each other's memory, which means each application can directly address the physical memory without requirement of translation or protection. The problem, though, is that what if there's less physical memory than the full address space, right? This is now not the problem of protection. This is just problem of resource management, right? So, for example, you have 32-bit addresses, you need to have up to 4 gigabytes. Your programs could address up to 4 gigabytes of address space. Although RAM wasn't always larger than 4 gigabytes, so you could have 2 gigabytes of RAM. How are you going to run in this case? And if you have 64-bit addresses, then you have 16 exabytes your program can essentially address that much amount of data. But realistically, we know no machine out there can support that much amount of data. Right? We're barely reaching the threshold of terabyte, of two or two terabytes at most. Right? So what happens? If program wants to use a lot of data, you don't have that much memory, what do you do? So this is the case where the physical memory is less than the total full address space of the system. And this is not an exclusive problem, right? You can have multiple applications that may possibly want to run in a real system at the same time. Then it's not just 16, but 16 exabytes multiplied by the number of programs. So what if you want to run multiple programs at the same time? That's another whole different question. So in order to address this problem of limited physical memory and each of the programs with their own addresses, what we do is Essentially, we protect each programs from each other without translation. So what we do is, is have a base and bounds. So we use a base and bounds to prevent user from staying into a designated area. And user tries to access an illegal address, it causes an error. This is known as segmentation. Segmentation is the simple idea of location independent programs. Programs do not need to specify an absolute memory address. Okay, so when you have a program, you, you can do position independent compilation. You don't need to know which physical address you're, you're absolutely going to reside in when the program starts to run. Independent programs should not affect each other inadvertently. 
So you need a limit for a limit or a bound register which needs to be checked on every axis. So if you look at the actual hardware, and this is done in hardware by the way, because you don't want to trap on every memory axis. It would be too expensive to trap and do this check in software. So because you know the check itself has to run with an operating system, you have the interrupt cost, and it's just it's just not a non-starter. So again, the, in this figure you've got your program address space on the left. And then you've got your physical memory on your right. What the program issues is an effective address. You combine it with the base register to generate a physical address. Simultaneously, you compare the address's range against the limit register to check the segment length. If both of these are okay, and the bounds is all okay, then finally you issue the address to the physical memory. If the bounds are not okay, or you, can't, or you can't address this location, then you trap to the OS and you, you have a seg fault on the boundary. Um, here show, we've shown you an example where you've got different parts of a single program. Right? You've got a subroutine belonging to segment 0, stack belonging to segment 3, segment 1 belonging to the square root function, segment 2's main program, all of these being relocated to different parts of memory. Not that what we initially spoke about was just a simple base bounds example, but in this case, we have a single process, multiple uh, sub blobs of that single process, like your subroutine, your stack, your symbol table, and we are relocating each of these to different parts of memory. So essentially preventing internal fragmentation in some fashion. What we're doing is making sure that each of them can occupy its own piece of memory, that not all of the memory that is cumulatively need to be allocated at a, single, at a single time. And the whole process is described using what's known as a segment table, where you've got as many segments as your process needs. So in this case, there are five of them. And each of them have their own base and bound, which are checked. In order to take a look at the animation, uh, use the link at the bottom of this slide. A process sharing model <laughs> occurs when the thing you got to care about with segmentation is what happens when the storage starts to get fragmented. For example, in this figure, um, in the first stage, we have a process that needs 16K, another process, a red process that needs 24K, another one that's 24, violet, so on and so forth. You have three processes that are running in the system. Okay, When processes 4 and 5 arrive, you allocate them. So process 4 gets into the 24K region, and you have 8k left over, right? Process 5 needs one all 24k, so you allocate it. Then process 2 and 5 arrive, uh, or process 2 and 5 leave, and when process 2 leaves, now you have 24k gap between process 1 and 4, and process 5 also vacated its own space. The problem with this is that now what happens if you have a process uh, that's 32k that wants memory? You really have total free space in this system is uh, two 24k chunks and one 8k chunk, a total of 56k of memory that's available to you. And the incoming process only wants 32k, except you can't vendor all this 32k from one chunk. So what you really have to do is compact these, move process 4 and 3 around, and then finally allocate space for the new incoming process. And this is the hard part, where essentially since not all chunks are equally sized, um, you have to compact them periodically. You got to remove some, uh, you got to allocate them, and then move things around in order to create the absolute space that you need. The next thing on the agenda we're going to look at is page tables.